Erica and Nicholas Christakis were successful and respected members of the Yale University faculty. She was a lecturer on early childhood education at the esteemed Yale Child Study Center, and he was a professor of social and natural science and a lead at a residential college. At Yale and in previous positions, they had argued against institutional policing of language and behavior. They believed that college students had the capacity and maturity to discuss contentious issues and work them out on their own. In the fall of 2015, as Halloween approached, Nicholas walked across the New Haven campus and engaged with a group of students, many of whom were furious. They unleashed a tirade on him. He was told that he had violated their safe space, that he should not sleep at night, and that he was disgusting. What had drawn such ire? What had this professor done to so, so severely trigger these students? From our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, this is the Psych Bites Podcast. The Psych Bites Podcast is where mental health professionals offer practical psychology to enhance your life. I'm Dr. Craig Pullman, neurodevelopmental psychologist. I'm Jennifer Feitz, licensed professional counselor. In this episode, we're talking about trigger warnings, safe spaces, and the so-called snowflake generation. In the opening, you heard just part of the two story of Erica and Nicholas Christakis. You'll hear the rest of that story at the end of this episode, after we go through a timeline and speak with two guests about the psychology and mental health implications of trigger warnings and safe spaces. Fights, you know, a lot of our discussion today is going to be centered on the college experience, what's mm-hmm. happening on campuses across the country. What what was your college experience like in terms of oh, I, I, let me be more specific. How much of a how much of a <laughs> bubble or a cocoon did you live in, in in college? I was about to say it's a very scary open-ended question to tell me about my collegiate experience. What kind of bubble? So I went to a small liberal arts college, and I think the big thing, as I was thinking about this before we started, is I went to school before there was internet or social media, right? Same. So email came out my senior year of college. Mm-hmm. I still registered for classes by hand on paper. Right. So when I think about answering that question, like what kind of cocoon was I in? Well, I mean, I feel like I had a full college experience. My parents let me travel abroad. Um, I, From that standpoint, I felt like I had a very robust experience. But I think from this idea of um, bubble, m- maybe I was in one because there wasn't this broader influence that was informing my everyday experience other than the students that were around me experiencing things real time with me and the one-on-one interaction that I had with my professors. And I'll also say that I was a fine arts major, right? So I was in an environment where artistic expression, having a voice, those kinds of things was was very welcome and right. expected. right. Yeah, How I went, about you? Yeah, I went to college right up the <laughs> right up ninety five from Yale um, at Brown. Oh, okay. And uh, I was like up ninety five. <laughs> I'm trying to do geography in my head. Uh, right, it's ninety five, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's been a few years, <laughs> and uh, definitely a cocoon bubble experience. So liberal, so progressive, and there are very few self identified Republicans or conservatives. So most of what I heard from fellow students and and, um, and faculty was uh, in more left leaning political stances. Uh, I will say a highlight though was I was there for a debate between G. Gordon Liddy oh, and mm-hmm. Hunter S. Thompson. I mean, it was bonkers, absolutely bonkers. Oh, I can and only fathom. Hunter S. Thompson, rest in peace. He was high as a kite. <laughs> he could barely formulate <laughs> he clear sentences. Um, Liddy really mopped him up on yeah. on stage in a polite way, he, but he's still yeah. And I would say to give a little picture of where I went to school, Maya Angelou was a professor. Oh yeah. So I mean, if that yeah. even sets the tone for like where our humanities department was like platformed from, mm-hmm. right? Like she was a what would you say? Not not like not even an adjunct professor. Mm-hmm. She was a full teaching professor where I went undergrad. So you know, but so, I really think you can't lose sight of the lack of social media. Piece being impacted. For sure. For, so, so that was the, true for both of us. Okay, so with that personal 
history for both of us as the backdrop. Mm -hmm. Another thing that that we're going to, well, we want to talk a lot about trigger warnings. And you've got all this experience and expertise with PTSD. So why don't you just orient our listeners to what a trigger warning is and where it came from out of the PTSD literature? Well, a trigger warning is something that we want to draw our clients' attention to to help them be able to then cope with the idea of when you have been triggered in some kind of way. But if you really look at it, you know, I want you to go top to bottom as opposed to bottom to top, right? Like if you have been diagnosed with PTSD. Which is, by the way. Post-traumatic stress disorder, Mm -hmm. excuse me. You have then experienced a traumatic event and then in five major criteria or major categories – You have then met criteria enough in each one of those categories to then be diagnosed with this mental health disorder. So one of those categories is the actual traumatic event. And then there's four other, right? There's cognitive symptoms, there's intrusive symptoms, there's arousal symptoms, and there's, oh my Lord, it literally just left my brain, but another one that I will strike me in a minute. But it means that in each one of those categories, there's five or nine or 10 different criteria points you have to meet, right? So not every person that experiences a traumatic event will then develop PTSD. But if you have, it means that there's a very holistic and global way that your life is being impacted, both in the way that you think, in the way that you physically feel, in the way that you interact with the rest of the world and intimate relationships. And so we would always say, pay attention to the way that you are triggered by certain things so that then you can draw attention to how best to cope in whatever that circumstance is. So that's always the relationship of like what a trigger is, right? It's very clearly pointed to this thing, this person, place, situation, or circumstance has triggered some aspect of my very identified trauma. The problem is is that this word has been watered down, I believe, my stance, the, 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 the trigger. trigger. I think the, trauma has too. I think trauma has been watered down. I um, and I think it sometimes really minimizes people's experience. But I think even the word trigger has been watered down of the idea that like I walked by you and you looked a certain kind of way and that triggered me. Now for a person that has experienced a very significant traumatic event and has PTSD, walking by a certain person. And their appearance or their smell or something could be triggering to them. But there should be a cause and effect component to that. Something happens and my physiological or mental space is then triggered to come either back to some piece of my traumatic experience. Takes you back Takes you back. And that's different than like a flashback, right? Which we're not – that's a whole other thing. But the point is is that there should be very specific cause and effect to that. So I, for at least the sake of this conversation, when we talk about like these students were triggered now this in our original story, maybe one of them was, right? Maybe one of, the, one of them very specifically had had a traumatic experience and something had happened for them. We don't know. But to say, you know, there's a difference between being offended and triggered. There's a dif- from, from a clinical from a psychology From a clinical sense. psychology perspective. There's a difference so, between somebody saying something provocative so let, let's – okay, let me paint an exa- <clears throat> very simplistic example, and you check me if I'm on base or not. Okay. On or off base. So um, a combat veteran. Yes. Experienced uh, the, the trauma of warfare. So he comes back home, and one thing that triggers a, a visceral, aroused response to him is any, any sound that's akin to gunfire. Correct. So – He's walking down the street and he hears a muffler go off, mm-hmm. and that is a trigger and is going to take him back physiologically. A hundred percent. All right. So then, so then a trigger warning would be his being aware that when he goes down certain streets or by a garage or something, yes. he needs to um, be vigilant about that, maybe avoid it or be equipped so that he can handle it. So is Perfect. That, okay. And I would say on the flip side, like another way to look at this would be, okay, so I as a trauma therapist... When somebody uses the word rape in like a colloquial story, like, oh, I got raped in that deal, I am reactive to that. That offends me. I consider that to be a very provocative word. I'm not triggered 
by that. It does not take me back to my own sexual trauma. And so I think that that's where we've lost some of the nuance of that word, right? Is is I mean, I would say that that word is inappropriate and is unkind and is all of those things, but it's not triggering. Now, to somebody that had experienced a rape, that could be very triggering to them. Right. So that's where we've got to be very careful about the way that we pass judge, like that, that there's not judgment about this. And if somebody's experienced something that we're not going to be like, well, no, you haven't. But I think we've got to be mindful societally. And as we're talking about this subject, we always want to get people thinking and talking here at Psych Bites. But like, we got to be careful. It, this is a really good point. So let me push my example a little bit to, to try to drive home this point a little bit more. Let's say we got the combat veteran I described, mm -hmm. and we got two other people. Mm -hmm. They all are walking down the street. They all hear that muffler go off. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the combat veteran, we've already established, he is triggered in a PTSD sense, post-traumatic yes. stress disorder, yes. okay, by that muffler. Person number two hears that muffler go off, and they've got sensitive hearing. And so it tr we, we could say in the colloquial sense, that person got triggered because it's highly annoying. It really, like that, ah, that just that ruined my morning to hear that go off, but no PTSD. And then we got a third person, doesn't care. Mm -hmm. that same, so the same stimulus affects mm -hmm. those three people differently. One gets triggered in the strict sense of PTSD. The other person gets highly annoyed or maybe even angry. And the third person, like, I don't care. It doesn't, doesn't So, I mean, I think me this is where now we're like splitting hairs of how do you define the word trigger? Right. And I think if you pulled out a dictionary, you would say, yes, OK, that loud bang triggered the person with a hearing deficit to be annoyed and irritated. You know, I put myself in those shoes and I hate jump scares. Right. Like I hate jump scares. Mm -hmm. And so I would have been terrified for that loud bang to go off. That has nothing to do with trauma, but just I, I don't I don't like sudden loud noises, right? And so my heart rate would have gone up. I would have been shaky and edgy. So that would have triggered a very visceral reaction from me. But I think that then it's careful, like the context that we're using when we're talking about a trigger for a human's psychological well-being versus a trigger for something that that uh, annoys us or and, and that's the problem is that that the term has it's moved beyond yes. the mental health realm yeah. and has taken on additional meaning. So mm -hmm. we're going to do the best we can today to yes. differentiate when we're talking trigger in a clinical PTSD sense versus trigger in the more vernacular sense that it's something really annoying. But let's let's uh let's do our usual timeline okay. on our topic, all right? Got it. So um, what we know as a liberal arts education has its roots in the Roman Empire. We're going way back. I was like, we throw it in way back. In the 5th century AD, the liberal, liberal arts really took hold. These were considered essential for a person to take an active part in civic life and included participating in public debate, defending oneself in court, and serving on juries. After the 9th century, humanities were added to the more scientific arts like geometry. The humanist curriculum spread throughout Europe during the 16th century and became the foundation of how elites were educated. So, so we the were both. Tooties. I was like, did we both end up with an elitist education? The yeah. notion of a liberal arts or humanistic education persisted into the 20th century. In parallel, we had educational tracks that were rooted more in the trades in learning very pragmatic skills to equip the workforce, especially in the industrial age. In the 1970s and 80s, the term political correctness, or PC, was co coined by leftists as self-critical satire. The term PC was used in a sarcastic or ironic manner rather than a name for a serious political movement. It was a joke among leftists for individuals who were too rigid in a adhering to political orthodoxy. The modern usage of political correctness emerged in the 1990s from conservative criticism and was popularized through media outlets, uh, Fox News chief among them. The left <laughs> believes conservatives use PC as a way to downplay discriminatory behavior and that the right enforces its own definition of PC to suppress criticism of its favored constituencies and ideologies. Did we just make like a bunch of people mad? In like two sentences. No, I, I, 
I think that's Fox was the is no, the I know, dominant I just, place. I'm, where, I'm like reading this. I'm like, oh, we just pissed a bunch no, of people off. No okay. value judgment. This is where it came from. It just these are just the facts, people. In 1989, the Gay and Lesbian Urban Explorers, or GLU, developed a safe spaces program. GLU was the source of the inverted pink triangle surrounded by a green circle that symbolizes alliance with gay rights and spaces free from homophobia. Okay, I have to give a shout out to our producer Brandon, who always does our research for a timeline. And that little factoid right there is one of the best things I've learned all week. Glue. Awesome. Glue. What a great acronym. The Gay and Lesbian Urban Explorers Glue. So a little bit of equal time. Yeah, I was going to say. For, okay, for our listeners. So a safe space is a place or environment in which a person or category of people can feel confident that they will not be exposed to discrimination, criticism, harassment, or any other emotional or physical harm. The earliest forms of safe spaces were gay bars and consciousness for raising groups like glue. Really, any ch- excuse we have to say glue today, we should say glue. Just glue. That's like a glue. It's yeah. a glue space. Yeah. In the 2010s, the term snowflake was coined to describe individuals that have an inflated sense of uniqueness, an unwarranted sense of entitlement, or are overly emotional easily offended and unable to deal with opposing opinions. So not a good term. <laughs> no, and, and I mean, <laughs> if we had... Disparaging. We, if we had three more hours, we could get into the frustration of the fact that um, sensitive has somehow begun to carry a negative connotation. Right. Yeah. Because I feel like our world would be a much better place if we had more sensitive human mm-hmm. beings in it. But yeah, sadly... Yep. So the terms Generation Snowflake and Snowflake Generation entered our vernacular following confrontations between college students and faculty over thorny issues related to race, trigger warnings, and the concept of safe spaces. So with that stage being set, we got our terms kind of defined. Mm-hmm. Trigger, trigger warnings and safe spaces. Going back to Glue. Shout out to Glue for safe spaces. And snowflake generation, which is a relatively recent term. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have some good conversation today, and we're going to pick it up on the other side. Joining us now is Dr. Leah Charnin. In her therapy practice, she serves adolescents, young adults, and adults navigating difficult life events. She's also a writer and scholar who has explored a range of issues, including sexual orientation and sexuality. She's been a voice here on Psych Bites before, and she is indeed, people, named after Princess Leia. It's true. Spelling and all. Mm-hmm. Thank my mom for that. Welcome, Leia. And Thanks. a fellow member of the Wise Minds team here at Southeast Side. All right. Cha-ching, small plug. <laughs> so... We have been talking about this concept of safe spaces and trigger warnings and the snowflake generation. And we uh, learned, we shared something interesting earlier that the whole concept of safe spaces came out of the gay lesbian community. The organization was glue. glue. Go glue. So, first of all, just share with listeners what your experiences are or how much of your clinical practice is connected in some way to the LBGTQ community. Absolutely. So my background is really largely clinically in college mental health. And that is an environment that is such a huge advocate in terms of creating these spaces and resource offices for students to go and be able to have conversations, connect with people of their community and have discussion. And so within that, many of the universities, and it's really standard policy within higher ed now to have these safe spaces, and particularly with LGBTQIA offices. So within that, I've done a lot of consultation in terms of what can college mental health and the counseling centers and how what can they provide, how they can, can they connect with the offices, um, how we also address mental health stigma, because just because um, we're saying, hey, this is counseling and mental health providers working with these groups, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, they have mental health problems. It's just we want to create a safe space for groups of people who have otherwise been marginalized and not have it, had a space. Um, so that is my background in terms of getting connected with these communities and really having these conversations within higher ed and then also creating a safe space within my office. What does that mean for a client to come in and talk about their identity and exploration of who they are, what this means to accept that part of them, what it means to talk to family or friends or have significant losses when they have come out, just that 
full range of experiences and emotions that come out for individuals who are of the LGBTQ community. Have you seen any difference related to size of campus, size of, of mm-hmm. student population? Fights and I both went to pretty small universities. I'm wondering if there's a difference between a small university and a, a small college and a big, like a state school. In terms of resource offices? Right, or, and just yeah. sort of the general vibe, receptivity to this concept of safe spaces, how well it can be, I guess, um, handled or managed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I do see a difference, particularly between the public state institutions and more private or religiously based institutions. Um, I, I say that because I, I think about with higher ed public schools, it is really standard to see that these diversity and inclusion offices and the umbrella under which these offices fall. So for example, a Center for Black Studies or having LGBTQIA um, offices or having a Latinx center. And so that's very standard within the state institutions, less so within the public institutions. And I think it really bases on who is part of the um, the dean or the higher ed administration. And then I think about also even, for example, more religious-based schools and the values that that's based on that we may not see as many of these. We're not going to see those resources. So uh, maybe... You could share some examples and obviously not um, relate any um, confidential information, mm-hmm. but any clients you've had who have, it maybe in their own words or, or in their own description, have been triggered by something yeah. in connection to the LBGTQ community. Absolutely. A lot of examples come up over the years, and I think particularly about – when we see events in in our public in which the community or individuals of that community are targeted and they feel unsafe. So it could be uh, off campus across the country or whatever in the news. Absolutely. So what I was just about to say was like the Pulse nightclub shooting and thinking about those responses of can I go to a, a place where um, people who are of LGBTQ community gather and still feel safe and working through that, what that means to be targeted, what that means to go to a place, and literally their lives and people of their community are taken. Um, I think about, for example, um, human rights campaign has statistics of the hate crimes that are, occur um, in, within 28, I think it was 2018, there were over 28 deaths for trans individuals mm-hmm. who were targeted. Um, of that, there are more black trans females who are targeted. So if we think about this in terms of also intersectionality, that the more identities and diversity that a a person visibly shows, Mm -hmm. that this isn't something that someone can hide. And it's also we're talking about experiences of I can't now go to a community that I would feel more connected and safe. And so how does someone really work through that? I mean, think about what that would be like to say, I can't go to my church Mm -hmm. and feel safe or I can't go to this place that provides support. Right. Mm -hmm. So within my work, I have very much so seen people come in so upset and scared for themselves, Mm -hmm. for their loved ones. Can they you know, where can they go and have conversations? I think this is why the safe space conversation is so important. Mm -hmm. where one can find connection in their community and say, I am scared and I am concerned and what can I do about that? Um, And that I also feel kind of misunderstood that others who don't feel persecuted or targeted don't necessarily understand what it feels like to feel so incredibly unsafe in their life. What about the two of you? How have you heard that in, in your clinical work? Ice is the trauma person. Well, no, I mean, it was funny yeah. because my brain, it's funny that you just lobbed that question over here because my brain was going in a completely different direction mm-hmm. about this underlying component of a safe place being rooted in non judgmental thinking mm-hmm. and the ability to be able to come in and without fear of being judged for your reaction or your feelings have a place to discuss that and the and the difference between um, a safe space on a college campus or within a community where that may not necessarily be led by a mental health professional. Like some space space safe spaces are almost led by peers, right? And it really is just this identified place where you can come and be with like-minded individuals as opposed to who who I guess I should add on to that, don't necessarily have the training or equipped to know how to step into somebody's mental health. They're just there to be 
um, a support system as opposed to like somebody walks into your office and my office and now I always attach to that um, feelings of shame and, and com- closely connected to fear as well. Um, and that ability to come into a space that is 100% non-judgmental and safe, but then that can also step in and provide very direct, acute tools and tips to then try to increase a person's sense of safety or their ability to advocate for themselves. And, and, and what is that, you know, what does that sort of look like? So, I mean, that was sort of rumbling around in my head, but I think, um, which is an important thing I think for us to consider as we talk about this concept of safe spaces and as we talk about it either from a way that we should have more of these and there should be more accessibility and we should be more open or there should be some idea of there being a line about everybody can find a safe space and everything is, you know, is sort of triggering that that somewhere in there is is sort of a happy medium. But I mean, I think, you know, coming into my office so often what I think I see is individuals that have been targeted by something directly. I mean, sort of very similar to what you said, where they have felt like either their identity or their safety or their belief system has been called into question, sometimes in very simple ways, more verbally, and then sometimes in very physically aggressive kind of ways and everything Mm -hmm. in between. But I think, you know, coming into our office is a very specific kind of safe space, right? It's inherently safe because it's confidential. But I was thinking about like the students, like I've never worked on a college campus, but I'm thinking about the idea of even walking into one of those places and how the fact of even walking into it then identifies you and so it removes some of that ability to necessarily always feel safe. So, I mean, it's, you know, my brain's spinning a little bit. You know, something occurs to me, we were talking in the first segment about how the terms trauma and trigger started in the mental health field and then... um, Trickle sort of crossed down. over, yeah. yeah, into the vernacular and become watered down. I think safe space went the opposite direction. I mean, according to our the timeline research, Glue, Glue came up with this idea of the Safe Spaces program, and then I think we've co-opted it in mental health to talk about the therapy experience in the therapist's office. Do, 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 yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I, you know, I say safe space a thousand times a day because as an EMDR therapist, where we start is the creation of your safe place, safe space. Like that's just like step one of EMDR is creation of safe place, safe space, which is a mental space. It's something that is not defined by my office or your office or a college campus. So, I mean, yeah. So, so, oh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to run with this. So, so I think about this in terms of safe space, the mental space, but also the physical. Mm-hmm. And even within the LGBTQ community and within higher ed, we have something called safe zone training. And safe zone is a training that anyone can go through. So peers, uh, academic advisors, anyone within that community and learn about terms, learn about ways to say, I, I can speak a language that I understand. So think about how uh, distancing that would be for one person to go and, and talk to someone and say, like, I'm struggling because I'm coming out to my family and I identify as a queer femme. And then the person that you're disclosing that to doesn't understand your language. That can be incredibly invalidating. And then it's like, well, I would totally shut down, right? And so safe zone training is an idea of how do I understand the terms? How do I understand identity development, like where this person is in their process of acceptance of identity and coming out, and also validating the safety, the historical context, these concerns that are very real, which is why when I think about snowflake and that term, like I I have a lot of pause personally with more marginalized populations because we have no idea what they've gone through. We have no idea what they've lost. There's an exercise within the safe zone training program where we have individuals visualize and have on cards names of your best friends, your house, your family. And very arbitrarily, we say something along the lines of, if your birthday is in May, take away this card. If your birthday or is in ends on the 8th, we take away your family. And so it's this idea of so much you can lose, and that in itself can be very traumatic. And this is going back to we have no idea what the experience is of another person and how much pain they've been in unless they choose to disclose it. And they're only going to j- disclose it if they feel like you can actually sit and have a dialogue and provide safety within that space too. So I think about that word safe what that means in t- terms of its physical, its 
communication. It's emotional in our brains, Trust. right? Trust. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, there's so much context to that. It's a very powerful word. But what's so funny, and I know you were about to say something, I don't want to, but like, I don't put safe zone and snowflake in the same conversation. So, I mean, it's weird that you connected those two things, but I see, or what always pops into my head, and it and it sort of flies all over me too, right, this idea, because we were just, you know, talking about sensitivity, like describing somebody as a snowflake, but what always comes into my head is somebody who is not naturally resilient, that doesn't either naturally have resiliency skills or has not been given the opportunity to develop resiliency skills. So I sort of picture, because, you know, Snowflake came out of this idea of being fragile, right? <clears throat> but what I think is so interesting is I see somebody who pursues either utilizing or creating a safe space as naturally being resilient because they have the ability to seek out help, right? They have this idea that like, I either I'm going to go utilize this or I'm going to create it because I feel like it's deserved. I feel like it's necessary. And that to me is the opposite of somebody that I guess in my head or how I've always pictured that word is sort of the opposite of that. So I mean, it's interesting. What I was going to say is the alternative term that snowflake generation people or so-called like or prefer is generation woke. They see their efforts as um, uh, putting uh, hate speech in its place, putting it down, putting it, you know, pushing it aside, challenging it at every turn. So uh, that's a much more positive term. But even that is getting derided, I feel, um, certainly from one end of the political spectrum. Because I think you do end up in this dialogue because it's interesting. One of the individuals that we I had a conversation about pursuing this podcast because we should maybe take this moment to say this is our first podcast that we're doing that was a suggestion from a listener oh that's right yeah so this is very exciting but this idea of um a real lack of resiliency and i see resiliency and mental and psychological flexibility as key as paramount as like if you're in my office it is like hashtag therapy goals so I think what gets lost, and 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 we're going to try real hard to be very broad in the discussion of this, is you're right. Hate speech needs to be put in its place, and it needs and it needs to be identified as hate speech, not freedom of speech. And I am also going to want you to feel like you can be resilient enough to stay in that conversation to affect change. Because if you can't stay in the conversation, if you can't stand in the face of somebody saying something that flies all over you, you are not going to then be able to affect change, which is ultimately where that finds its place. Here's where I agree with what you're saying, but here's where it gets tricky. As as you both have said, you don't know what another person's experience is. Mm -hmm. And so it might be too big of an ask for someone who is so triggered or actually has experienced PTSD or it has PTSD to then engage in that dialogue. So it's, it's from the outside, it's hard to, to point to you know, a certain person like you need to be more resilient or you need to challenge that versus I know I just need a safe space. A hundred percent. That's, that's and the I mean, rub. And, and you're exactly right. I had used the example earlier, Leah, before you joined us of when I was trying to define trigger about when somebody uses the frame raped, like I got raped in that deal. And I said, that flies all over me, but I am not triggered by it where somebody who'd been in experience, okay. So, you know, let's use that example, right? Of somebody standing there in this conversation and somebody uses that word. And I think the danger is if we then say, oh my gosh, that's that's a trigger word for me, that, you know, and and they, like you're not going to have that opportunity to educate somebody and to be able to say, you know, I just want to throw out there the idea that you never know what somebody's experience has been and the ability to stand in that gap and try to have dialogue with somebody and provide a little bit of education and see if you can have a little bit of a back and forth. And you're right. Somebody who has maybe experienced sexual assault who is actually triggered by that, it's not their job to do that. But if we approach everything in sort of this black and white, these words are good, these words are bad, you know, you can either say, like, that's allowed or that's not allowed. 
I my worry through a lot of this and then, you know, bringing it back to full circle to the collegiate campus is you're going to lose the ability to educate somebody. And that's the whole point. I and mean, that's a huge reason why you should pursue post high school education. That's the is history. the ability to like educate. Like self. we talked about that's that's the origin of the liberal arts education. Right. Mm -hmm. to, Absolutely. To prepare citizens. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And the more that we come into perception or um, concepts and ideology that we are haven't been exposed to before we start critically thinking in different ways and it, yes. and there is research to support like this can actually address and reduce biases and make people feel more connected and i think that is the very key in higher ed right in the in the point um and at the end of the day, why also we have visible centers for students who have been otherwise mar marginalized to come together and to feel like they have a space. And those centers can also provide training to individuals who don't understand the struggles or the experiences of those students. So it's really about connection in that higher ed community. This is such a complicated topic, so much yes. to unpack. Yep. Leah, thank you for helping us do that. Yay. Absolutely, really my pleasure. It. Thanks, Craig, and Fights, yeah. We're gonna pick this discussion up with another guest on the other side. Joining our discussion is Dr. Brianna Campbell. She has lots of experience counseling on college campuses. Much of her research and clinical work has aimed to break down barriers that ethnic and racial minorities experience regarding therapy. She holds a special interest in working with people of color as well as first-generation children of immigrants. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Yay! So the, your, college can, can, your college counseling experience, mm -hmm. uh, how big of a university, how big of a campus? I've been at universities where there are about 4,000 students, as big as 60,000. So oh, it kind of spans So the, a small country. You know, yeah, a zip <laughs> code. Right. <laughs> right. And, well, we'll get to the, the I'm curious about the difference yeah, between the, say that's a huge but, difference. But how about your, your experience counseling mm -hmm. um, uh, students and, and having therapy, you know, the clients that have experienced some sort of triggering or a need for a safe space? Yeah. Um, so I'll just come out in the beginning and say I identify as a black woman, a person of color, and that's pretty important to the work that I do. Um, and oftentimes that... Um, I found that students of color on campuses need a space to be able to talk about their experiences and talk about um, how the world is impacting them and how current events are impacting them. Um, I'm trying to think a little are they, bit. Are they needing, are, are, are you sensing a need for a safe space with you therapeutically, or are yeah. they looking to achieve a safe space mm. on the campus as a whole? Both. That's a really good distinction, but I've found that both is necessary, or that's the feedback I've gotten from the students is that both is necessary of having a designated spot on campus for them to be, as well as having a place in therapy or either individual or group therapy to be able to express what's happening for them. Mm -hmm. Particularly related to yes. their race and gender. And, yes. Okay. Yes, a lot of the college counseling experience I have has been at um, predominantly white institutions. So oftentimes what comes up is how do I navigate mm. this new place? It doesn't it may or may not look like where I've come from. It may it may and if it does, I still don't know how to navigate it cuz it's different and if not, mm. this is a brand new experience for me and I don't know what's happening and I feel overwhelmed. Mm. Maybe you could share with us some specific examples of um trauma that students have come to you mm -hmm. uh, to, to discuss, to, to work through things that, that, that have triggered them mm -hmm. and how you've helped them? Sure. Uh, one that comes to mind is um, it was a, a young black male and it was after one of the numerous police shootings that have happened of an unarmed black male. Um, he expressed feeling like I don't even feel com I already feel strange on campus, but now I'm starting to feel even more unsafe. And I feel like there's a target on my back at all times, and I'm wondering how am I supposed to be able to concentrate in class? How am I supposed to be present in my social interactions and make all these connections that I need to make, as well as just exist in all, in all honesty? And so, um, and this is a person who after one of the police shootings happened, he himself experienced being followed by the police on campus because he quote unquote fit a description. Um, so he mm -hmm. already had the, the double up of what mm -hmm. happened for him. 
And so we worked on just normalizing that, validating what happened, knowing that it's not your fault. And the, the part that's really difficult is it's a it's a problem that there's no foreseeable end to. So it's an ongoing piece that keeps happening. And how do you manage throughout these times? And a part of that was finding a community where you feel safe enough to talk about this and feel validated that this did happen. You did not deserve the treatment that you got. And it really is terrifying out here in this day and time. It has been for a long time, but... Um, when that first experience, I, I'm wondering how deep to get, but like in those the racial identity models, that first encounter with an experience can all all can be traumatic. Of I've never known this to be true. I've heard about these things. I've heard about racism. I've heard about microaggressions. But the first time it happens to me, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. And so. We worked on normalizing, validating, um, giving coping skills of how can you manage in the moment, but also empowering of, so what can you do for people around you that also have experienced something like this? And the healing in the empowerment and healing in creating a community. It's interesting as I was listening to you talk that, so when I'm working as a trauma therapist with somebody who I say is in it, Right. So they're still in it. So a little bit of what you were addressing, oh, there's not a foreseeable future. Right. So let's mm-hmm. say I'm um, like, for example, I have a, a client whose daughter was severely, severely injured in a car accident and she's still in it. There's still doctor's appointments and unknowns and and potential far reaching impacts. Right. And so that therapy looks very different because that whole idea of we're still, you know, battling the unknown and your brain is still in protective mode. Okay. So, but that to me is I know at one point in time, there will be an end, right? There will be, we will get to a point where you're no longer quote unquote in it. And so now we can work on healing and the new normal and moving forward. And so what you just described really acutely is this idea of what if somebody was quote unquote in it, the rest of their life. Right. Indefinitely. Indefinitely. And so that kind of therapeutic work looks very different. And I wonder if it ever feels for the individual like there's no end. And 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 I mean, I see you be like, like, yes. <laughs> um, but then I was also thinking about the idea of, you know, within the LGBTQ community, there's that phrase ally, right? Where you are very much an ally. There's somebody that they can identify that is going to speak on their behalf and is going to come alongside. And so I wonder more in in the realm of, you know, racial and gender kind of like, do, is there that same concept and a way to then be that ally and save space? Or is it just somebody that's willing to come alongside? Like, is that same model of saying... I see you for exactly who you are. I'm alongside you and trying to help other people become, I mean, like, does that phrase translate or transfer in the same kind of way? Because I was listening to you talk about this young man and I can, you know, I can feel my own anger on his behalf and then the compassion that I have, you know, I mean, all those things. And it's like, okay, well, how does that translate and and does it feel the same? Like, does that concept of ally feel the same in, in creation of like a safe space and... All of that. I don't know if my question was clear or not. Is there sort space of? for allyship? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Does it look the same? I, I don't know if it looks the same because, again, it's this – I'm searching for the word. I'm thinking chronic, which feels fitting, but it's an ongoing – piece of like there's no foreseeable end to it but at the same time allyship is absolutely possible and being able to voice that I don't think that what happened was right or Mm -hmm. I don't you may have an idea about what people like me may think but I want you to know blank or what Mm -hmm. have you or Mm -hmm. I'm going to go speak to such and such about some of the things I've been seeing knowing that you may be in it right Mm -hmm. now and so I'll go and do that but I also feel like checking with in with people about what looks what not looks, but what feels helpful, helpful and yeah. authentic and not just trying to suppress any type of white guilt. Or mm-hmm. is it authentic in that you truly do see me and you do care about what happened and what or what is happening or my place on campus? And I've seen white allyship happen. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's authentic. Of mm-hmm. I'm enraged and I can't imagine what that looks like every day to live every moment, basically in fear. Mm -hmm. Um, So 
I think it's absolutely possible. Is that helpful? I found it to be helpful, but it also depends on the person. It depends on the person and it depends on is it from is it coming from the place of, um, like I said, guilt or empowerment of I'm coming from a place of trying to empower you as well as I'm thinking of it in a way of like if someone is tired and it's like, hey, I'll do this because you're tired. I know you need some rest or what have you, and I'm going to go ahead and do these things for you, not for you, but to address some of these things for you versus I'm at 100%, I'm fully energized and I can do this on my own, but I'd appreciate your presence. If I go to do something, I would appreciate if you had my back. Like Mm -hmm. if I need signatures, if I just need someone to go to the dean's office with me, if I'm starting a new program or what have you, you just being there is authentic. The term snowflake generation Mm -hmm. has been used a lot in the context of campus visitors, Mm -hmm. guest lecturers, guest presenters, who have a political agenda or ideology that is at odds with a significant chunk or just some of the students. And I'm curious, have you had any therapeutic experience with your counseling of of students needing help handling someone coming to campus, a visitor that, that is And that visit, the prospect of that is triggering them. Yes, I have had that experience. And uh, most of the work is around what do you need for yourself in this moment and the idea of choice or are you going to choose to engage? If you do choose to engage, what types of things are you going to do to be able to take care of yourself? Are you going to be not necessarily you're in agreement with what you're hearing, but are you what kind of skills can you use in the moment to be able to know that? They might be saying something that does not feel good to you. That's okay. That's going to happen during your time on earth. Like, that's going to happen. (laughs) Um, But what can you do to take care of yourself in that moment? Might that be, I won't go alone? Might that be, I'll use some breathing techniques? Might that be, I'll stay for 15 minutes and then leave? Whatever that is. I have had that experience as well as um, the idea of, making sure that after, what are you going to do after you, this has happened? So even if you choose not to attend said um, experience, what are you going to do that day? What route are you taking to class? Are you going to class that day? Are you, are you going to stay home? If you are, what do you, basically, what are you going to do to take care of yourself while this is happening? Because it's going, yeah, it's going to happen whether or not you want it to happen most times, sometimes. Because it seems like you have options. You could not attend the Mm -hmm. event, avoid it. But as you say, if you're on campus, it may be hard not to feel it in the air. Mm-hmm. Um, you could attend, and then you really need to have the, the the emotional equipment to handle it. Or you couldn't be involved in like a protest or something to try to, to right. shut it down. Have you ever have you worked with anyone who's in that and in, in that lane who really wants to um, be an activist? Yes, I have actually, and that it's more intense. Of you need to be taking care of yourself like all the time, all of us need to take care of ourselves all the time, but it's going to look different in terms of if you're going to be on the front line, what does that look like? What do you need to know about yourself in these moments that other people may not know? So like knowing what's your limit in terms of how far you can go with this and what's your, what's the purpose behind this behavior? What's the passion behind it and making sure that you're feeling empowered, but you're also feeling like you have the tools to know what I'm, what you need to do in this moment. Any experiences? Well, all right. Let, let, let actually let me pose this question to, to both of you, hmm. and and you can help our listeners understand some some treatment approaches here. A client who has a diagnosis of PTSD and has been triggered by something on a on a on a campus, being followed by police, something like that, and then you've got the more vernacular, colloquial type of trigger that we're talking about. Um, so it's those two clients, any differences? Talk through how you would approach those two people differently, those two clients differently, if at all. Throw it to you first. I think one of the first things that I would do, because I feel like knowing and understanding ourself our brain, our reaction, our responses is key first step, right? We always say problem solving 
is a coping skill, first step of problem solving, information gathering. So I need to know and understand myself well. And avoidance is so impulsive and knee-jerk reaction for a lot of us, right? I mean, there are things when I know it's hard, I'm like, I just don't want to do this, right? And so if somebody comes into my office and they say, I've been really triggered by fill in the blank, I'm probably going to do a little exploring and say, is your brain just really, really, really not wanting to deal with this? And so you're saying you're triggered because it's going to be easier for you to just not deal? Or are you genuinely being triggered to where this is impacting your ability to think clearly? It's impacting your ability to function. It's impacting your, you know, your physical ability to get up and out of bed. If the answer to the first part of it is just somebody said something that I really didn't like and it and it brought some stuff up with me, but I just don't want to deal with it and I want to be avoided, I'm probably gonna go, okay, well. What that first of all says to me is, you know, our emotions communicate things to us and for us. They are very purposeful. If your knee-jerk reaction is to avoid, it probably means it's meaningful to you. Let's talk about how you can best handle that, not avoiding it. Because A, your brain's going to keep firing at you till you pay attention to it. And B, maybe there's something really that needs to be said or that needs to be done to advocate for yourself. And what does that look like, right? Because that could be on a huge spectrum of even just from self-care to protest, right? So there's this huge span. If it falls in that category, that's maybe how I would address that. If it falls into the category of what we described at the beginning of that genuine PTSD trigger that comes with impacted cognitions and body sensations and emotions and interaction, then we're really going to dig into like some, some clinical tips tools that you're going to need to use to manage your own well-being and really focusing on that on that self-care and caring for self and and beginning to minimize some of that through psychoeducation and my you know I mean all those clinical tools that would then come in and and that are very specific because I mean I think that's one of the difficult things um and I'm going to ask you to to jump in as I say this but one of the things that I say all the time to people is you can be a victim of sexual assault and I can be a victim of sexual assault but those two things look very, 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 very different because trauma is so uniquely experienced. So you could say I've been the, you know, the victim of, of discrimination as a black female, and I could be the victim of sexual, or excuse me, racial discrimination as a black female, and that's very, very different. So then the idea of how do I uniquely address that is going to be then very specifically rated to the person and their triggers and their history and their experience, and then how they're met by their environment when they go to somebody and say, I'm struggling, I've been triggered, or I'm hurting, right? So then, I mean, I think that that's where then it becomes very unique to the person and their experience. So I don't know, you know, how how do you feel like you would answer that differently or, or similarly or, or would, you know, is that idea of, of triggers versus like, you know, a trigger from somebody that has that's not necessarily related to an actual PTSD diagnosis? I feel like I'd answer it pretty similarly, in all honesty, but also keeping in the context of like the the idea of race related stress is a real thing. The mm. the idea that um, it affects our minds, our bodies, our, our physical health, everything that comes into that. But I think the psychoeducation piece is key of learning to discern the difference of I don't want to deal with this and this is an inconvenience to me versus I legitimately feel unsafe. I feel mm -hmm. like my existence is not okay. And that, I agree, I would treat it the same. I guess I was wondering, and as I was listening to you talk earlier as compared to Leia speaking, what do you think either, you know, compare or contrast the concept of safe space on a collegiate campus for an individual in the LGBTQ community versus a black female or a black male or a Latino female or a Latina male? I mean, like, or you know, how do you think those things either look similar or different? Because I feel like I have sort of my own idea formulated in my head, but I'd love for somebody way more experienced and smarter than me to, to educate me about it. I, I feel like we also have to keep in mind the intersectionality of like there are black females Those that are, identify. Well, I mean, Leia has that fantastic as, statistic that's really yeah. been in the news, and today is the International Day of the Girl. Boop, boop. All right. Is it um, that, you know, the most currently targeted, especially in gun violence, are transgender black females? Oh. I feel like the idea of safe space, I, I would say it's pretty similar because people, the intersectionality, you, you can't avoid that. But again, the more marginalized identities that are held, I feel like there's a 
there's sometimes even a greater need for safe space because the more on the fringe you feel, the more isolated you feel. In the fall of 2015, Yale undergraduates got an email from administration urging them to be cautious in their choice of Halloween costumes. The email contained links to costumes that were not recommended because of the potential risk of triggering fellow students, such as through cultural insensitivity. A couple of days before Halloween, Erica Christakis sent an email on the role of free expression in universities. She contended, from a developmental perspective, that students might wish to consider whether administrators should provide guidance on Halloween Halloween attire, or their students might be allowed to dress themselves. Campus protests ensued. Many students criticized Erica for placing the burden of confrontation and maturity on the offended rather than the offenders. Any message about free expression and dialogue was drowned out by the outrage. When Nicholas engaged the students just before Halloween, he tried and failed to convey his confidence in their ability to handle difficult topics and offenses, that they did not need faculty or edicts from the administration for protection. But too many students had been triggered and their safe space violated. A few months later, he stepped down from his leadership role in the residential college at Yale. 